それでは時間になりましたので。Ladies and gentlemen, it's now time, so we would like to start plenary session 5 debate on just transition towards sustainable societies in Asia and the Pacific. This year at ISAP, from November 9th to the 13th, over five days, we have had 13 thematic track sessions online. And also today, We have had four plenary sessions, and thank you very much for kindly attending all our sessions. Here at this final plenary session, we will look back at the day's plenary sessions and also the thematic track sessions over the five days to discuss the just transition towards sustainable societies in Asia and the Pacific. If you can please look at the screen. In this session,、uh, you will be able to use Slido, a, a, ch a chat tool,、uh, for some interaction. For over 50 minutes from now, we will be receiving your messages or questions over Slido. You can use either English or Japanese for input. And now, I'd like to hand over the microphone to Mr. Yasuo Takahashi, Executive Director of IGES, who will be making a framing presentation for this session and also will serve as facilitator in the discussion after that. For your kind introduction,、uh, hello and welcome to plenary session five, where we、uh, will be de debating on just transitions towards sustainable societies in Asia and the Pacific. My name is Yasuo Takahashi,、uh, Executive Director of IGES, and I would like to start the session with. A presentation and to reflect on what was discussed during ISAP 2020 and frame our final discussion. Uh, this year, ISAP was held virtually for the first time ever with the theme Just Transition Towards Sustainable Societies in Asia and the Pacific, Building Forward Better for Our Future Beyond COVID 19. This session is the last of five plenary sessions all held today. In addition to today's main program, we also had a series of thematic track sessions from November 9th through 13th, which covered a range of timely sustainability challenges in the COVID 19 era and beyond. Meanwhile, our partners and relevant stakeholders have also been holding virtual exhibition booths at our online venue. This year's ISAP was a new under undertaking for us to overcome these challenging times. In all sectors of society around the world, we are navigating how to respond, recover, and redesign in the face of COVID 19. To provide an integrated and coherent way forward, IGES has developed the Triple R framework. The framework is composed of three building blocks response, recovery, and redesign. Response refers to targeted issue specific in interventions needed to address the pandemic's immediate health and environmental impacts. Recovery involves advancing social, economic, and environmental policies, especially those found in stimulus packages, to ensure resources are allocated to sustainable priorities. During and after COVID 19. Redesign involves transforming institutions and infrastructures that often prevent lasting changes to, to our energy, food, and other critical support systems. Redesign is critical during the response and recovery phases as it will shape development paths during and beyond COVID 19. It involves a process of constant Re evaluation and refinement as we aim toward a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive world. And what are the key terms of ISAP 2020? This word cloud has created using key terms submitted by the session leaders. It shows the most、uh, prominent terms from ISAP sessions include green recovery, redesign, resilience. Sustainable development, low carbon technology, and ecological sphere. 
Now, before we divide delve into our final discussion, I would like to I would just like to look back at all the sessions this year, uh, starting with today's sessions. We started today's program with video messages from the Minister of the Environment of Japan, Mr. Koizumi, and Mr. Kuroiwa, the governor of Kanagawa Prefecture, which is where IGES is based. Afterwards, IGES present, President Takeuchi highlighted in his opening remarks that as the world's societies and economies try to recover from the enormous damage caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, it has become more important than ever to commit to social, societal changes for sustainable development and not simply return to normal. Then Mr. Steiner of UNDP deliver, delivered his keynote speech, which echoes the fractured relationship between humans and nature. He spoke about nature-based solutions to advance the sustainable development goals and, and to build forward better from the COVID-19 crisis, and emphasized the need to rethink our production and consumption systems, especially in food and agriculture. The Satoyama Initiative can be a model for rebuilding communities that are in harmony with nature. During, uh, during plenary session one, uh, Professor Takeuchi led a discussion about synergies between biodiversity, climate, and the SDGs with high-level guests. I was happy to learn that our discussants from international organizations, international financial institutions, and think tanks share the same goal of aiming towards a resilient and inclusive society. For this, discussants highlighted the need for a green recovery and just transitions by em employing a whole of society approach and fostering new partnerships with diverse stakeholders. Then, uh, during, a <coughs> during plenary session two, Professor Takeuchi led another discussion centered around Asia. The discussants shared that the pandemic has exposed may many social vulnerabilities in the region. At the same time, they highlight the potential for green growth through access to green finance and technology. Then, uh, plenary session three focused on the science policy interface within the context of the IPCC and IPBES. Indeed, as the issues of climate change, biodiversity, and COVID-19 are interlinked, the integration of these issues is necessary. These discussions highlight the role of scientists in mobilizing action, showing that the IPCC and IPBES can and should, should work together to engage and deliver the science to policymakers and the rest of the society. And just before this session, plenary session four provided a very interesting discussion featuring business leaders. We were able to learn about how businesses are supporting the 2030 agenda despite of significant effects that the COVID-19 crisis has had on their operations. It was interesting to learn about the Society 5.0 approach by the Cajun Lane and about the WPCSD's commitment to, mid, to a mindset shift including resilience, reinvention, and regeneration, which is another set of three Rs. And indeed, Michael's emphasis on the potential of the SDGs to measure and mitigate financial risk is also extremely important going forward. As for the thematic track sessions, we had, uh, we had 13 sessions, as you can see in this slide, earlier this month. They covered a broad, broad range of subjects, including climate change, biodiversity, SDGs, waste and water waste, and wastewater management, cities, governance, lifestyle, and technology transfer. It, dem it demonstrates that IGES is addressing this issue of COVID-19 pandemic from a broad perspective fully utilizing our diversity of expertise. We invited 58 external speakers to share their insights and views with us over these 13 sessions. I would like to take this 
moment to express my gratitude for their participation, which further enriched our discussions. Thank you very much. Now, uh, let us reflect on the thematic track sessions briefly through the lens of the triple R framework. Firstly, res response. Communities have responded to the crisis through implementing local innovations. For example, various technologies and policies were used to respond to emerging waste management concerns uh, depending on the local context and pre-existing systems. At the same time, a few sessions have em emphasized the vulnerabilities that put certain groups at a much greater risk or disadvantage than others. These include essential workers who often face a higher inf infection risk through their occupation. In the context of waste management, we also learned that there are large resource gaps between rural and urban systems within countries. Meanwhile, more generally, even though responses are targeted and issue-specific in interventions, we learned that it is still important to consider the secondary effects of these response, responses through examining the synergies and trade-offs. This is particularly important in the case of multi-hazard situations, such as when it is necessary to set up safe evacuation centers for extreme weather events during a pandemic. A few sessions also pointed out the importance of social cohesion or community ties. Societies with more social cohesion were able to respond more effectively to the outbreak. Secondly, the thematic sessions also point to recovery being a critical pivot point for redirecting redirect resources toward more sustainable and resilient development paths. It is becoming clear that for a successful green recovery, we need to share or agree on a, vi on a vision of the free future we want. Without this, recovery measures can be quite piecemeal, as shown by the results of the energy policy tracker. Speakers in thematic track eight spoke about the, the importance of greening stimulus packages by applying conditions, as in the case of airline bailouts in Sweden, Austria, and other countries. The session also revealed the possibility of cap capitalizing on, on untapped opportunities such as teleworking that could improve the quality of life and drive forward a more sustainable development path. Finally, redesign. The sessions emphasized the re re that redesign is about transforming systems, structures, institutions, and even dominant mode of thinking. Mode, modes of thinking. It is about creating new govern governance structure that promote horizontal and vertical integration, as described in thematic track one. One major way to create integration at the local and regional levels is through the application of the circulating and ecological sphere concept. And critically, uh, given the structure of vulnerabilities and in in inequalities and equities, well, inequities exposed by the pandemic, redesign also integrates the need for in inclusive decision-making processes. When moving forward with just transitions, bottom-up and participatory approaches from a variety of stakeholders are critical. Finally, a couple of thematic track sessions pointed, pointed to the necessity of questioning modes of thinking through constant, constantly re revisiting the vision and definition of a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive society. This kind of critical thinking is essential for the pa paradigm shift on which redesign is based. So here I tried my, tried my best to share a few major impressions after participating in and observing the many interesting discussions that have already unfolded at ISAP 2020. Congra congratulations to all session leaders and moderators for their brilliant session design and facilitation. I hope that my colleagues can supplement our learning from ISAP 2020 in the following discussion rounds, since I may, I may have missed a lot of important points during my presentation. So now, uh, 
let us deepen our understanding on redesign and just transitions towards sustainable societies further with uh, a couple of main questions. I have three questions. So I would like to uh, have the discussion one by one. So round one, let us start from the first question. The first question is uh, the plenary and thematic track sessions shared a range of insights on the concept of redesign. What are your major takeaways regarding redesign? So on this uh, question, I would like to ask uh, Eric, Amanuma-san, uh, Kataoka-san, and Takashi-san to address this question. So first, I would like to invite Eric first. So Eric took the lead of Triple R framework development in Niger and joined quite a number of ISAP sessions. Eric, you have the floor. Hey, um, thank you so much, uh, Takahashi Shicho, and uh, uh, this is a very important question, and I think it's a question that we touched upon in uh, many of the ISAP sessions. So um, in terms of redesign, I envisage this concept as having sort of three different uh, applications or, or dimensions. I think the, the first one is in terms of the infrastructure. So we see that there's a need uh, with the COVID to uh, make uh, our, um, our transport systems, our food systems, uh, our urban systems uh, more resilient. Uh, and uh, this is not only a need, but there's an opportunity to do this. So there's an infrastructure that's very much on the hardware side. Then the second point is a little bit more on the software side where we talk about the institutional frameworks, the way that uh, typically governments organize themselves and also interact with other stakeholders. I think there's a very strong opportunity with COVID to change the way this works. And just to let me highlight a, a concrete example. I mean, I think in the wake of COVID now, there's going to be a lot more emphasis on how ministries of environment work with ministries of finance to determine where resources flow. I think this is a, a promising development and the institutional structures that can facilitate that coordination, I think are going to be increasingly important. So that's the second part, the institutional part. And then the third part that deals more with ideas and norms or, or if you want knowledge systems. And I think what we're seeing happen in the wake of COVID is also an opportunity to reorient or change the way that we think about the environment and how the environment provides a critically important support system for society. Um, and this also gets to the linkages between environment and uh, some social issues, uh, and particularly this idea of just transition. I mean, I think, of course, to facilitate the just transition, we need to have uh, more inclusive institutions and decision-making processes. But I think the other part of this is also we need to restructure the way that we think about how social issues and environmental issues interact with each other. So there's three different dimensions of the redesign for me, and those are the three that I mentioned. The last point I want to highlight, and this was, I think, a question that was raised, is regards, you know, when do we start the redesign? Because this is a longer term process. Well, what I want to emphasize here is that while it will probably take a longer time to redesign the way that we think in our institutions and our infrastructures, the time to start on this is now. I mean, we need to begin in the short term to achieve effective long term results. So just because we want sort of long lasting change doesn't mean that we should hesitate uh, because something's going to have long lasting impacts. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Eric, for your uh, comment, and uh, it uh, helps us to understand more clearly the uh, idea of redesign uh, in three uh, dimensions, and also you urged uh, early action. Thank you very much. So then uh, now I would like to ask uh, uh, Amanuma-san, uh, who was the moderator of the Business and SDGs plenary session today. So Amanuma-san, what are your major takeaways regarding the concept of redesign? Yeah, so in my session, uh, we had three business leaders, and I was really happy to hear that they have in common the sense of urgency, um, and they take COVID-19 as an opportunity to put our society back on track towards sustainability. And in terms of the redesign, I think they have 
Uh, they have common vision in a way that they want sustainable, inclusive, resilient world. And, but it was interesting that they had different uh, touch to their own vision. In the case of uh, Kedarin, for example, they had Society 5.0. 5 uh, in the case of WBCSD, they had Vision 2050. Um, and then uh, in terms of Kedarin, towards, uh, towards Society 5.0, they, uh, they want to have sustainable capitalism. That's the way that they, 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 they go. Uh, towards society 5.0, and in terms of uh, WBCSD, they had the keyword transformation toward Vision 2050. So, um, so these are their concrete answers to, you know, what is redesign. Um, uh, so, so that was a direct answer that I got from them. And what I, um, and uh, thank you, Eric, for your. Uh, your insights and like what I can add to it is that there, there's, there's not just the hard uh, infrastructure or soft infrastructure, infrastructure like institutional arrangement, but the business leaders also highlighted the importance of mindset shift um, that we shouldn't be afraid of changes, but rather we should, you know, uh, be resilient to changes that might happen in the future. And they also highlighted the importance of shifting the values uh, of, of individuals, uh, for example, from owning things to sharing things. So I think these things, at, these changes at the business level or individual levels are also uh, complementary to what Eric has already said about uh, hard infrastructure and uh, you know, institutional arrangement type of things. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alma san uh, Very concisely uh, summarized the session uh, on by the business person. I sh I, I shared your view. Uh, I my impression is the, the discussion is very positive and with a sense of sense of urgency. And uh, all the uh, business person have a very clear vision, future vision. So it it was very encouraging. I think uh, session. Thank you very much. So uh, the third discussant is uh, Kataoka-san, and Kataoka-san is from the City Task Force of IGES and has moderated a couple of thematic uh, track sessions. She may have insights on the perspective of, of local governments. So Kataoka-san, uh, what are your major re redesign takeaways? Please. Thank you very much, Takahashi Shocho. And then the, I moderated two semantic sessions focusing on local actions uh, with the topic of brand tree local review of the SDGs and then circulating ecological sphere we call the CES. So through the session, uh, we recognize that the role of local governments and regional governments uh, in accelerating transformation of world is more and more recognized at international and regional community in the context of the with and after the COVID-19 as a provider of essential urban services, as well as a provider of the platform to strengthen the actions for sustainability at the local level. Local and indigenous governments are now confronting with many challenges of response and recovery of COVID-19. And also, they are also at the front line in redesign. They are close to the life of the people and therefore they can closely listen to people and then the people's voices and then uh, take a quick actions. So they are very important, very, very important role of the in, uh, promote inclusiveness of the local government. So I think the encouragement and then the creating in the in, enabling environment for them uh, to take more productive action is very important. Also, the pandemic gave an opportunity for local governments to rethink their sustainable future, a uh, future of localities, and take more inclusive and integrative actions. Even though local governments are confronting and proceeding the difficulties associated by the negative impact of COVID-19, actions of local governments shown in the sessions are certainly become a basis to turn their gear to, uh, to, to the design, uh, accelerated redesigning. So more local governments notice that partnership and local solidarity is important to strengthen local resilience. So platform creation of actions contributing SDGs among different local stakeholders. Uh, so this is shown in Yokohama cases. So city to city collaboration or mutual learning among the cities very uh, effective, uh, showing by the cities in Finland and also Japanese and ASEAN cities city to city collaboration for the local society, uh, decarbonized society. 
So Sado cities approach to integrate policies and actions, local community revitalization, conservation ecosystem services, and protecting their tradition and culture give more thoughts on the action, uh, more thoughts on integrated actions. So the, I think, brand new local level of SDG uh, uh, at the topic of the semantic track one uh, could be important too to accelerate inclusive uh, local development development for redesign. So as a uh, president, uh, vice president of ADB, uh, Mr. Sansono, uh, pointed out in the first plenary today, session today, uh, Brandy Local View can be a tool to enhance the network of local stakeholders, also share the goal of vision of local, local wisdom. So by strengthening this climate created part of the uh, v VLR, a brand local review. It can be a simple version of a local determined contribution (LDC). So I think the um, you know we would like to uh, emphasize the link with climate change and SDGs here. Lastly, I would like to recall that saturating ecological spheres says is the concept of realized triple R frameworks that is the uh, emphasized in throughout the sessions. Uh, this is my reflection. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Katako-san for your uh, input, and uh, as you mentioned, you have a very uh, fruitful, fruitful discussions uh, in the thematic session and also in, in the plenary session uh, about the very important role of the local governments uh, on this issue. And we have a very uh, many, many uh, good uh, examples from uh, local governments from in Japan and also from uh, abroad. And uh, I think it is in. On this issue, uh, I just have a very uh, important expertise uh, for VLR and uh, uh, circulate and ecological spheres uh, concepts. So uh, I believe we have a much uh, potential to further cooperate with the local, local governments to uh, enhance the sustainability uh, after COVID-19. Thank you very much. So, so uh, uh, final discussant uh, in this round is uh, Takai-san, Anaza Takashi uh, in IGES, who joined the plenary session on science, policy, and implementation earlier, and also facilitated uh, thematic track sessions on the Satoyama initiatives. So Takai-san, what are your major takeaways uh, regarding the concept of redesign? Please. Uh, thank you very much, Edi Takashi-san, and good evening, everybody. Now it's uh, sunset time in uh, Japan, in Hayama now. And I'm uh, representing uh, the summit track session uh, 11 on the Satyama and also uh, the science policy interface, uh, which is uh, plenary three uh, this morning. And in the summit track session 11, uh, we discussed the relevance of uh, socioecological production landscapes and seascapes, um, uh, which is separate or uh, in Japanese, Satyama Satyumi. Uh, uh, relevance of this uh, kind of landscape to COVID-19 uh, response and recovery. And uh, in our session, um, uh, we highlighted the importance of CEPOS to uh, the build resilience of the society. Uh, this landscape locates uh, somewhere between urban and nature areas. So um, the resilience was highlighted by uh, the Richard this morning in the first session. So, uh, CEPRIS is very important uh, space to provide resilience for the society. And from the science community perspectives, and we are now discussing redesign, of course. And redesign, in, uh, we need to think about the redesign of the decision making. Uh, for example, now uh, because of this crisis, people are uh, increasingly moving from the urban to rural areas. Uh, which means that uh, we are moving towards a more decentralized, decentralized society, and where we need more decentralized decision-making institutions. And in this context, um, the local science and its contribution to local decision-making has become uh, increasingly important. And not only a kind of pure Western science, but traditional knowledge is also very important. And in this context, as uh, Ms. Uh, Bambam uh, pointed in the first session this morning, uh, participation is uh, really important. Uh, in this context, uh, the science policy interfaces at the local level, uh, which uh, integrates local knowledge, traditional knowledge, has become more important. And um, because we are 
increasingly uh, reliant on the IT information technologies. And in this uh, decentralized context, uh, we need to uh, st strengthen the efforts to allow uh, universal internet access and IT education uh, for future uh, with no one left behind. So uh, for the uh, session 11, uh, we uh, compiled all the discussions in the uh, draft issue brief, uh, which is uploaded to the uh, session page. So for details, please look at that. And yeah. I think that's it from uh, my side now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Takahashi-san, uh, for your input. And uh, uh, concerning the South Tema initiative, uh, I, I am very impressed uh, this morning that the, uh, Mr. Steiner of UNDP, uh, in his speech, uh, keynote speech, uh, I mentioned uh, South Tema initiative is a very uh, important initiative of Japan. Uh, based on the traditional uh, traditional uh, methodology of Japan to manage the uh, relationship between nature and human and nature, and it will contribute uh, greatly to the, our future uh, effort for uh, biodiversity conservation. So uh, uh, I think I, I just is playing a very important role to enhance this initiative, and also uh, concerning the uh, science and the policy. Uh, I'm also very impressed by the discussion the, on the importance of uh, participation and uh, also outreach. So uh, outreach, participation and outreach is uh, also very important for, for IGS, I think, for, for our future activities to disseminate our uh, policy research, results of policy research, researches. Uh, so it's a, it will be a very uh, informative discussion for us. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank all the four discuss discussants uh, again for their insights. And then I would like to move to the next round, uh, second round of discussions. The uh, question for the second round is uh, to pave the way for long-term prosperity, what are the key priority areas for further greening the current response and recovery? In addition, what does what are some untapped opportunities? So for this uh, round, uh, we have Kumara, Bao, uh, Kainuma-san, and Kojima-san to address this question. So first, I would like to invite uh, Kumara. Uh, Kumara is a member of the uh, IGES Center for uh, Center Collaborating with UNEP on environment, uh, environmental technologies and uh, contributed to the session on the waste management. So Kumara-san, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Takas Sajo. Uh, let me share a few points uh, from the session that uh, our center is uh, coordinated in the ISAP session. Uh, it found that there is no argument that the COVID-19 pandemic has posed uh, some fundamental development challenges to the society, particularly developing countries where we are working. At the same time, uh, we discussed there are great opportunity for recovering better if uh, our leaders are committed to make changes and take actions effectively, that is very important. They need the commitment and the, and the take actions. Uh, but uh, what we learned from the, our work, because uh, as a recent uh, UN report uh, of SDG progress in the Asia Pacific region, is uh, clearly mentioned that uh, we're going to miss all 17 goals uh, by 2030 in particularly sustainable consumption and production goals and the targets related to the chemical and waste management. I think that is what our team has been working, uh, going backwards even before the COVID-19. So we found that because of these things in our recent uh, publication with the uh, UNEP, uh, understanding the waste management uh, under the COVID-19 situation, uh, most of the developing countries which have uh, poor waste management systems are more vulnerable in dealing with this uh, sudden uh, situation than the countries with have proper waste management systems. It's give us that uh, very importance of having uh, proper waste management uh, systems within the countries and cities, particularly uh, healthcare waste and increasing of the plastic materials and, and also uh, safety of the informal uh, sector who mostly handle the waste management in these uh, cities and the countries. Uh, 
And in that sense, we found that the, in that discussions, national and the local governments had to develop uh, not the response, but also recovery plans that will reverse uh, their current trends and shift more on consumption and production patterns uh, in the future. Uh, this uh, successful transition will need uh, to consider resource efficiency, uh, life cycle assessment, and improving the chemical and waste management, increasing their uh, resilience against the future uh, COVID uh, kind of a situation. To achieve a green recovery, what we discuss in our, our, our discussions, we found that the, it is not need to limit it to the green technologies because we found uh, these days this green recovery green is discussing more on the technology perspective it should be more comprehensive comprehensive redesign of the society uh, to the uh, green recovery integrating a very important uh, aspect like a systems uh, because we look at waste with the water and the food and the, the, the combination of this uh, nexus between the waste and other systems and also proper institution, not the policies, because we found a lot of policies are already there, but the importance is how implementation of the policies and monitoring and the effective uh, uh, effectiveness of the enforcement. And finally, it is very important, the people, we call it is agents, agents should be understanding and, and building their capacities to work on, uh, to move in from the waste management to resource efficiency society in Asia in the future. But finally, I, we also understand it is very important to re-examine re the international cooperation to make this happen because uh, we found in the recent Oxfam report mentioned that the uh, uh, international aid fails to meet the need of the recipient countries and also uh, uh, recipient countries and, and their needs and their, their aspirations because this is mostly we found in our most of our, our projects we work with the, in, in the countries, uh, there were a lot of projects are failed due to not properly understand the needs and the, and the aspiration of the local, uh, local people and the cities. So in that sense, uh, we, we, we need more new values to respect the needs and the priorities of developing countries, uh, applying more participatory practices to think. Uh, linking the global agendas with the local aspirations. So I will stop here and our team will be work more on this subject in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kumara-san, for your very comprehensive uh, uh, comments. And uh, yeah, actually your, your session uh, dealt with a very urgent, important issue for uh, the developing countries to tackle with the huge uh, increase of the waste uh, uh, or is possible infection. So uh, it is very important for response, but I, I'm very impressed by your comment that it is also need, necessary to think uh, more uh, holistic way and also with a future uh, plan, a recovery plan, uh, including the uh, future uh, consumption and production patterns uh, or uh, whole of society approach. And also you mentioned about the uh, comment or uh, points uh, for uh, more effective international cooperation. Thank you very much for your very uh, integrated uh, comments. Now uh, I would like to move to the second uh, discussant. Uh, I would like to invite Bao San. Uh, from our Natural Resource and Ecosystem Service Unit, and uh, he joined the session on wastewater management. So, Baosan, please, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Takahashi Socho, for your questions. And uh, I believe that there's a number of key priority areas, including the waste sector, that we need to consider. And one of those uh, key, key priority areas, which I would like to highlight today, is uh, water and sanitation. That has been discussed uh, during our ISAP uh, thematic session number nine. Uh, and you know, uh, may know that uh, the COVID outbreak has uh, re-emphasized the important roles of good water and sanitation service and proper hand washing in order to minimize the microbial risks and protect the human health during the outbreak. Uh, because of lack of the access to clean water and sanitation in many uh, developing ASEAN countries, including for hand washing, so it can trigger the impact of the pandemics, especially for the vulnerable group of people, like people living in the slum area or people living in the 
highly density area and um, waste and waste, uh, wastewater worker and so on. And uh, you may know that uh, as of today, uh, we can see that uh, more than uh, 63 million people around the world infected by the COVID. And unfortunately, uh, more than 30% of them are from Asia. And the sort of infection as unknown in majority of cases, it can be through human to human contact, but or it can be through the, uh, the contact with the COVID uh, contaminated uh, object or item, such as uh, waste or wastewater or human feces. Uh, especially in a highly density uh, country uh, or city like New Delhi. Uh, I, I, I read, uh, we, we read the recent report that uh, the sort of COVID infection is unknown in 50% of cases in New Delhi and 66% of cases in Mumbai. So similar situation has been observed in many other countries. Uh, so therefore, the sort of infection can, be, can also be due to the poor water, uh, sanitation and poor hygiene, including the poor wastewater and waste management practice. The reason I said like this is because there's a number of increasing reports around the world uh, regarding to the detection of the COVID uh, from human feces, uh, from the road domestic wastewater, and also from the hospital wastewater. And unfortunately, uh, more than 80% of, uh, of the wastewater from Asia are untreated and discharged directly into the receiving water body. So it creates a huge potential risk to the community living in the nearby. So therefore, uh, one of the key priority area which has been highlighted uh, in our thematic session uh, is the need of uh, proper domestic wastewater management and treatment for the reason, which should be considered both as a short and uh, long-term uh, priority area for environmental sustainability beyond the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, although it's a challenge, but also we discussed about how to turn this challenge into the opportunity. And one of that is uh, we discussed about the, the role of the regular surveillance of the virus in the domestic wastewater, which can be used as an effective uh, early warnings and complementary tool to uh, clinical surveillance of the COVID. Uh, this uh, can help to monitor the chains or determine whether the pandemic has been brought under the control or to facilitate the forecast of the new uh, possible outbreaks. Uh, actually, this approach has been um, effectively applied in several countries, including Australia, China, and even Tokyo uh, Metropolitan. I heard that um, uh, the, the wastewater sample has been taken recently to monitor the COVID infection as well. Um, so um, in essence to that, uh, many countries uh, around the world, uh, including uh, in uh, Asia, start to, uh, to look beyond the current uh, health crisis uh, by providing, uh, providing the financial support uh, through the economic stimulus package for economic recovery, which is very important and essential. However, uh, I think that we should not uh, undermine action to limit the threats from the environmental degradation due to the poor water and sanitation, which could be a destabilizing factor to our society and economy, just like COVID, but on different times, time scale. Uh, and moreover, the long-term environmental impacts of this, those uh, economic uh, stimulus packages and policy response must be carefully uh, evaluated in order to ensure that this response uh, aligns and synergizes uh, with uh, environmental protection targets and goals. Yeah. So that's uh, that's my um, feedback to uh, to your question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Bao Baosan, and uh, thank you for reminding us the importance of uh, clean water. Access to the clean water or proper treatment of wastewater is very critical to uh, control the pandemic. And also, you mentioned the uh, possibility of the monitoring of uh, uh, sewage water can be the, the early uh, warning system for COVID infection. So it is also very important issue, I think. So thank you very much. Uh, then I would like to move to the next uh, discussant, uh, Kainuma-san. Uh, Kainuma-san has a long career working on IPCC assessment reports and has led other important developments in the climate change discourse. discourse. So Kainuma-san, what are, are the key priority areas for further greening the current response and recovery? Also, do you see any untapped opportunities? Kainuma-san, please. Uh, thank you, Takashi Ocho. And I'll talk based on the results of two thematic tracks, TT10, which focused on Asia, and TT13, which focused on Europe and Japan. Both discussed challenges and opportunities for green recovery toward net zero emissions. 
Presenters from China and India emphasize that development co-benefit is more likely to drive shifts in energy policy and long-term strategy, and that it is important to ensure energy investment to be in line with low carbon targets in the long run. Indonesia's case study showed that forestry policy involving private sector could accelerate the transformation in agriculture and forestry uh, practices in the region. I just present a stress the significance of regional collaboration strategies for net zero emissions in areas such as energy interconnection, decentralized renewable energy systems, decarbonization of industry, and sustainable land use. TT13 focus on the economic and social impacts caused by the COVID-19 crisis and climate change, such as transition in industry sector, employment, and finance. Scientists emphasize that the green recovery and resilience are necessary for a sustainable future. The European Green Deal shows that presenting direction and time axis for climate neutrality can be made to boost powerful investment and innovation. At the same time, promoting renewable energy and energy efficiency can contribute to job creation along with building infrastructure and capacity by being endorsed by long-term strategy and measures. The COVID-19 crisis gave rise to finance climate nexus. The Green Deal can leverage economic recovery and financial stability, but values are likely to change in the post-COVID world. The traditional drivers of value have been shaken. New ones will gain importance, and there is a possibility that the gap between what the market's value and what people value will be reduced. The panelists highlighted the first, an integration of climate mitigation policies and development goals is more needed to yield more policy changes than abstract net zero targets. The second, collaboration among countries in Asia is crucial to achieve green recovery and regional strategy. And the last but not least, the time for talk is over. The pandemic has shown the weakness of relentless development. The endeavor towards realizing decarbonized society must be faster and more extensive. Climate agreements without sanctions and incentives need to be changed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kainama san, for your uh, presentation. And uh, actually, uh, you, your uh, session uh, dealt with a very uh, important and very hot issue of uh, zero carbon uh, strategies. Uh, our Prime Minister recently uh, declared uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, and many uh, Japanese uh, local cities are already uh, declared uh, the carbon neutrality. So, uh, and uh, I just, uh, uh, this spring, uh, published uh, uh, zero carbon, net zero carbon report by 2050 in Japan. And now uh, our colleagues in IGES is now preparing for the next uh, report on uh, Asia uh, zero carbon. So uh, this issue is also very uh, focused uh, issue subject for IGES. So, uh, and uh, your discussion, uh, your report involves uh, many, many important uh, uh, elements of uh, uh, future uh, strategies, including the necessity of uh, regional collaboration in Asia. So, uh, I, I, believe, I hope uh, IGES's uh, policy research will uh, enhance uh, those uh, uh, efforts, including the uh, collaboration in Asia and uh, trying to establish uh, long-term strategies uh, for Asian countries also. Thank you very much. Uh, so the, uh, I would like to move to the last discussant on this, of this round, uh, Kojima-san. 
Uh, Kojima-san is uh, engaged in various green recovery-related research and operations at IGES, including the energy policy tracker with IAS, IASD and the platform uh, for redesign 2020 with the Ministry of the Environment of Japan. So uh, based on your experience, uh, Kojima-san, please share your view on the key priority areas for further greening the current response and re recovery. Also, please share any untapped opportunities you have in mind. So, Kojima-san, please. Thank you very much, Takashi Shocho. So, uh, so our session, uh, thematic session eight on um, green recovery, uh, one of the key messages was the uh, importance of having a clear, clear vision of sustainable resilient future society, and then uh, so which is a key to uh, say, enable green recovery that can contribute to uh, effective transition to sustainable resilient society. And just, just here, uh, I'd like to illustrate one example. So one of the uh, key vision might be the balanced like, development uh, among mega cities and then local cities and then uh, more local area, like uh, local mountainous areas. And then uh, one of the, the un untapped opportunity, which we realize the uh, effectiveness uh, for transition might be uh, teleworking, like uh, now, uh, widespread teleworking. Before COVID-19, it wasn't so much as a practice, but uh, as a response to COVID-19 crisis, once teleworking was introduced, then we realized it's not only effective for uh, COVID-19 uh, response, but also the many possibility to change our society, including the more has a free uh, selection of living place. Even office workers can live like remote area, uh, not necessarily near to office. Then uh, we can combine this kind of uh, untapped opportunity, like, um, uh, more practicing teleworking with uh, green stimulus in terms of uh, investment in local areas, which can create more jobs. For example, like uh, uh, investment in local area uh, in uh, like undergrounding transmission cables, which make uh, say, the local areas uh, scenery beautiful and more attractive for many people, which can be good for uh, resi uh, residents and also for uh, tourists. And then also investment in uh, uh, decentralized renewable energy system, which can contribute to local economy and also more sustainable like energy system in local areas. Also investment in uh, like a safe and comfortable bicycle lanes and then a pedestrian lanes, which can make uh, uh, transportation in local area more attractive for the, uh, maybe for younger generation who can uh, say, move to local areas with uh, teleworking. And then also the investment in digital transformation, which facilitate not only teleworking, but also uh, for example, like on-demand uh, public uh, transportation, which is crucial for elderly people and then maybe disabled uh, or like uh, uh, ill people uh, moving. And then also the such uh, digital transformation can be effective for uh, diversification of job opportunity in local areas, including profitable agriculture. So once we have a clear vision, like, uh, okay, for uh, sustainable and resilient future, we'd like to have more balanced uh, like a development in country, like not only uh, focusing on the mega cities, but the more uh, prosperous local community we'd like to have, then we can combine this kind of untapped opportunity and then well-designed green recovery policies, which can make our society more like a, a say, uh, enjoyable and, and then sustainable, and then also resilient against the uh, climate crisis and also maybe natural disasters. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kojima-san, uh, for your uh, very uh, clear uh, description of your session. And uh, uh, I recognize that the most important uh, thing is uh, have a very clear vision uh, for the future, a sustainable future. And uh, also, you mentioned uh, many uh, uh, opportunities uh, for future transformation. Uh, including teleworking, and also uh, possibility to uh, the investment in local areas to make a local area more attractive and more uh, uh, yeah, improve the living environment. 
and also the possibility to transform the uh, agriculture, for example, uh, utilizing uh, digital technologies. So uh, I think there are so many uh, opportunities for uh, utilizing uh, digital technologies and uh, uh, to change our society to a more sustainable uh, way. Thank you very much. So uh, this is the end of the round two, so I would like to uh, thank again for the four discussants uh, who, uh, made, made a, who have made a very uh, positive uh, input on, into our discussion. So uh, I think uh, in the third round, I would like to address uh, some questions from the audience. So we have maybe 10 minutes, 10 minutes or so for this uh, Q&A. So I would like to invite uh, the ASAP Secretariat uh, here and pass the microphone to uh, Otsuka-san. Uh, please uh, come in. Thank you very much, Takahashi Shocho. We have about uh, four or five questions from the audiences. All, they are all interesting. And we have the uh, IGES researchers from the all ISAP sessions uh, stand by for asking the, not asking, the answering the questions. Uh, and then there are the questions, uh, by and large, uh, focusing on the recovery uh, processes uh, together with the response and also redesigning. Uh, we also have an interesting question regarding the uh, economic stimulus. Uh, so that, like, you know, I'd like to go through one by one. And the first question is about the or uh, the engagement with the major stakeholders, which is on the top of the list. So that uh, uh, I'd like to appoint those who has an experience with the stakeholders, in particular, uh, Amanuma-san for business and Fujino-san uh, for uh, the local governments. Uh, and uh, I lead up the question for, uh, I, I just uh, lead up in the question, for enabling the just transition what is IGES's engagement with major stakeholders such as businesses, local governments, youth, civil society, and others? So that uh, perhaps uh, Amanuma-san first. Thank you for the question. Um, as I said in my session, business is a critical stakeholder to work with towards uh, just transition. Uh, because if we want to achieve the SDGs, we definitely need their uh, their their engagement. So at, here at IGES, we have been working closely with, for example, Global Compact Network Japan. It's a network of companies who are committed to sustainability. And uh, what we have been doing is that uh, we conduct a survey every year to the members, member companies of Global Compact Network Japan to see their level of uh, understanding of SDGs and how they have worked on SDGs over time. So we have been sharing this kind of information to the public so that uh, you know the public, which inc also includes the business uh, people, uh, get what are the uh, front runner companies are doing on SDGs. And so that's one concrete example of how IGES has worked with business. And of course, uh, going into the future, we would like to continue to work with um, this kind of uh, uh, business sector stakeholders uh, to, so that we can inform business sectors our uh, research uh, outcomes or uh, research or uh, expertise on sustainability, and uh, which also includes good practices on like uh, initiatives on SDGs, uh, new concept that the business stakeholders can take advantage of, new tools, framework, um, any new information, any uh, useful in insights uh, we would like to share with, continue to share with business stakeholders. Um, and also, um, of course, you know, we coming from a research perspective and business colleagues coming from the uh, business pers perspective, we may not necessarily have uh, the exact same understanding of everything in the world but it's I think it's also important to uh, keep our um, 
trust to each other and continue our dialogue so that we can work towards a common goal of sustainable world. So thank you. Thank you, Amanama san. Uh, the same question goes to Fujino san. Fujino san, can you come in online? Ah, uh, yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so thank you very much for the questions. Um, yeah, I'm in charge of the like uh, cities and then uh, cities are place uh, where these things happening and then local government. It is the closest to the body, governmental body to the ground. So um, the role of IGS are how we work together with city uh, by listening the voice by cities, for example, any difficulty, any barrier to go to low carbon, zero carbon SDGs. For example, uh, when we work together with uh, KL, Kuala Lumpur City, um, we support to develop low carbon society scenario or uh, plan. And then um, DBK, uh, KL City Hall uh, develops her own uh, visions, 70% uh, uh, CO2 carbon dioxide intensity uh, uh, decrease by 2030. But next question, how to make it 70% reduction? Then um, we had such a consultation by the uh, KL City Hall Vice Mayor. So we asked Tokyo Metropolitan Government because the, you know local government know the, the situation of local government. And also local government create the innovation. So the role of IJC is to connect uh, between uh, such as, you know, cities who had solution and then cities who need solution. And then we will understand the process, how the front runner city can develop such policy or uh, uh, technology. And then we uh, bridge the, such as the city now. And DBKL, uh, KL City Hall, uh, almost succeed to secure their own budget to having retrofitting the city hall uh, uh, energy saving building. So um, such is the uh, things I just can do and then uh, I'm very much happy to do more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fujino-san. And then I'd like to move on to the next question on the list, uh, which is on the uh, fundamental or systemic changes which uh, may be related to the uh, the design aspect of our discussion. So then I'd like to designate Eric-san first and Kataoka-san uh, for the second. Uh, I'll lead up in a question which is, supposing that fundamental systemic changes are needed, uh, when do they happen or when should they happen? Eric has already said it's an uh, immediate issue, but then perhaps like, you can explain a little bit more about this, Eric-san. Yeah, thank you so much for this question, um, Otsuka-san. And uh, I think this is a, a critical point. So I, I think, um, of course, uh, it's a, it's important for this to happen as, as soon as possible. Um, but uh, I want to also underline an additional uh, related theme. I think part of the reason that we need to begin this as soon as possible is it's, it's the redesign is, as we suggested, it's about this the infrastructure, the institutions, and the changing of the knowledge systems and the way that people think. And I really think if we get the, the relationship right between those three different areas, the, the infrastructure, the institutions, and the way people think, that we can start a transformative process. I mean, I think that this, when we talk about transformation, a lot of times we think of it as almost an, an end point. But I, I really think what uh, what we need to do is have you know, I think this perhaps was stressed a lot in Watabe-san's session, is have the, this, this collective change in consciousness where people are constantly re reconsidering uh, what sustainability means to them, how they can achieve it, and, uh, and how achieving it can um, uh, create the bigger and broader changes at a societal level. And so um, we need to start right away. And we need to think of this not only as, you know, sort of structural changes, but as a, a change in process, um, because uh, if we start right away, that change in process also will lead to, to bigger and better results. Thank you, Thank you. Erickson. And then Kataoka-san, can you come in as well? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Otsuka-san. Um, I free echo the Eric comments, and then the, I think the, it is now uh, to bring the fundamental changes. 
you know, the, we need the fundamental changes as soon as possible. Uh, this is, a, you know, the, as I mentioned in the previous, you know, the, uh, my comments, uh, I think the, uh, we, are confront, we are confronting with the COVID-19 negative impacts. Uh, we now think, you know, uh, we now try to, uh, we are now gradually change how to see our society. And then we think how we should work and how we should collaborate and how we can be more safer and more resilient. So it's a time for us to rethink our society uh, for, yeah, for society's change. So I think this is, you know, it's a good opportunity for us to now, you know, uh, to bring the systemic changes. So also the, um, yeah, so the, I think the, um, you know, um, Sense, sense of the uh, collective, you know, need of the collective changes is increasing now. So I think the, you know, um, yeah, although uh, we, we need to, uh, you know, uh, take actions now for uh, fundamental change. Also, fundamental changes should be, uh, should n uh, need some step by step approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kataoka san, for sharing your view. And then uh, our, the next question is about the uh, green recovery related uh, or the green stimulus. Uh, so that I'd like to invite Kojima-san for addressing this question. There's only two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, why do you think we are at this moment in our journey with respect to achieving a just transition? Where, where do you think we are? We are? And the uh, relevant questions uh, by the audience includes the, it's a tricky question, a uh, difficult question to ask them maybe, but you know, how to overcome the green washing associated with the recovery stimulus. So that you, know, you are familiar with the uh, analyzing the, uh, the government or uh, actions uh, regarding the green recovery. Perhaps Kojima-san, you can come in and share your insights. Okay, Otsuka-san, thank you very much. I cannot own video, but uh, anyway, I don't know why. But uh, yeah, so anyway, thank you very much. Uh, so about uh, just transition, uh, so yeah, actually, as I'm uh, involved in a, a, a platform for redesign 2020, uh, which uh, Ministry of the Environment of Japan uh, host this uh, platform, and then I collect the uh, uh, recovery policy uh, and the re redesign policy information from various countries. And then uh, I think the, the in terms of uh, like green recovery, there are several interesting cases. So already um, various countries uh, started uh, such effort. But in terms of just transition, it's a bit uh, uh, tricky. And then, uh, of course, uh, I say many victims of this COVID-19 crisis is uh, like, uh, I say, disadvantaged, uh, like, uh, like weak, uh, weaker uh, portion of society. So in, in this case, of course, response is a bit, I uh, say, have a just uh, perspective. But uh, in terms of uh, say, addressing root cause of inequality, I don't think there are much progress uh, in, I say, to address root cause of inequality in the current recovery package. So in this, mean, uh, in this sense, I think uh, uh, still there uh, has more effort to think about the just transition aspect is more and more necessary. And then about the greenwash, uh, a bit a yeah, very tricky question. Always they are kind of like free riders and then, uh, you know, the, uh, say, the, the people who just uh, say, try to uh, disguise uh, say, the green, uh, say, this kind of greenwashing. But so I, I, it's a very difficult question how to overcome this. Uh, I think, yeah, <laughs> just, just repeating, like one, once as a society, like, uh, and then also maybe, uh, like, uh, the society leaders have a strong commitment to actually, like, uh, promote and then, uh, how say, realize, uh, transition, like green transition, sustainable and uh, resilient transition, then, how say, people can aware of such, uh, like, greenwashing and maybe more critical against greenwashing. So I think this kind of, how say, like societies, uh, mood and support for sustainable transition might be most effective way to address, overcome such greenwashing uh, attempt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kojima-san, all the respondents. And it's about the time to finish this uh, Q&A and uh, I'll put the microphone back to Executive Director Takahashi. So Takahashi, please. Uh, 
Okay, thank you, Oscar san So let's move to the final round. And uh, the final question is uh, given the discussions that have unfolded at ISAP 2020, how do you know, uh, how do you now envision a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive society beyond COVID 19? So, as a strategic policy research institute and the agent of change, it is important for IGES to visualize the future we want and disseminate new ideas and policies and institutions that enable us to move forward. So we frame the future we want as one that is sustainable, resilient, and inclusive. But this vision could be explored further. So the final round, we have uh, Tamura-san, Watabe-san, Andre-san, Zou-san, and uh, Fujino-san. So my first, first uh, discussant is Tamara-san, who is the program director of the climate and energy area. So how do you envisage a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive society beyond COVID-19? Tamara-san, please. Um, thank you very much. And um, can you hear me? OK, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to take the floor. And as a researcher of climate policy and climate in, uh, energy policy, I'd like to see the realization of a decarbonized society over the next 30 years. I learned a lot from the speakers at this ISAP about how to move forward. But decarbonization posed a huge challenges to any countries, which they currently rely on the fossil fuel. But I want to highlight is that the importance of socioeconomic transformation, changes in the people's value, way of thinking, custom, and social institutions. And to do so, we need both changes in consumption and behavioral pattern at individual levels, as well as changes in economic and technology systems, which enable such behavior change happen. Uh, let me explain this by addressing three points. First, as long as we continue the current pattern of economic de uh, development, we need to heavily rely on certain technologies, such as BEX, biomass energy with carbon capture and storage, in order to decarbonize the economy. To avoid this, at the first step, we need to significantly reduce energy consumption. And here, the value and way of think, uh, thinking matter a lot. I just want to take an example of the uh, one experience of COVID-19 as an example that tells us the importance of changes in the values and perception. Under the COVID-19 pandemic, a teleworking and tele uh, teleconference widely spread like this ISAP, which in turn dramatically reduced energy consumption of commuting and traveling. But technology for teleworking and uh, teleconference actually exist long before. But what hinders the teleworking and teleconference was our way of thinking or preconception that we have to work at home Oh, no, sorry. We are, uh, have to work at the office, and we have to meet face to face. But even though it was induced by the crisis, when we actually experienced our body and perception have changed, and now behavior accordingly changed. And the second, such changes in body and individual behavior do not spontaneously occur. Rather, such changes required economic and technology system, which enable such uh, changes occur. And this leads to the importance and the policy, as well as the companies which provide relevant technology and the services. Now, sadly, it is important to say that if decarbonization will take place based upon such socioeconomic transformation, it does not necessarily impose patient and inconvenient on the society. Rather, it provides numerous opportunity to improve quality of life. Uh, let's uh, take, uh, let me take the example of telecommunicating and teleconference uh, again. I think already Kojima-san mentioned uh, teleworking teleconference uh, not only reduce uh, energy consumption, 
but also saves a lot of time. So we can use such saved time for our own purposes and also our own family and so on. So this is just one example, but this it's important to recognize that the decarbonization open up a lot of, lot of opportunity to improve our, our uh, quality of life. So this should be more widely spread by not only policymaker, but also barrier uh, stakeholder and the public. So yeah, that is in my uh, uh, intervention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tamara-san, uh, for your intervention. And uh, actually, uh, for, you, uh, for your project, uh, the, uh, the future vision is rather clear. Uh, decarbonization is a very clear uh, concept, but of course it is very uh, not so easy and very complex uh, pathway. Uh, need a very broad range of uh, uh, stakeholders, and need good, we, it needs a very uh, thorough discussions. So your project is very important. Thank you very much. Then next, uh, I'd like to ask Watabe-san uh, for your comment. Uh, he is a program director of the Sustainable Consumption and Production Unit, and he uh, uh, chaired the session on uh, uh, sustainable living. So, uh, Watabe-san, please, how do you envisage sustainable, resilient, and in inclusive society between COVID-19? Thank you very much, Takasan. Uh, well, uh, I chaired the session uh, thematic track five on uh, collaborative learning for sustainable lifestyles, uh, which brought together practitioners working for sustainable living on the ground level. And uh, the session highlighted that uh, the pandemic has put different impacts to different categories, different groups of people. For instance, uh, some of my colleagues already mentioned their uh, teleworking experiences, but uh, actually not it was not the option for all. And uh, tele uh, online uh, learning as well, uh, the, these were uh, mostly for the, the uh, people in the privileged uh, conditions like economic or internet connection and so on. And uh, we also know that many essential workers kept working as usual, facing the risks of infection and others lost income sources immediately. So, so uh, in short, uh, the, uh, the pandemic, what pandemic has told us is the, the structural challenges of inequalities and vulnerabilities. And uh, unless we uh, address these structural challenges, we cannot stand the next shocks. Uh, so that's the first point we discussed. So uh, from this point, uh, we uh, more or less agree that there's the issue of sustainable lifestyle is no longer just about reduction of excessive consumption or greenhouse gas emissions, but also about combating these structural challenges for our living conditions or socioeconomic systems that support our life. And uh, another important point from our discussion uh, is that uh, although we have already witnessing a lot of changes in our uh, value systems, our behaviors or infrastructures and so on, but we have yet to see the full picture of the changes caused by the pandemic. Uh, for example, the restrictive measures uh, of the government caused certain changes of behaviors, uh, which in turn prompted the changes in goods and services provided or changes in the, the uh, ways, uh, for example, our companies or organizations manage uh, their, their employment systems and so on. And then these changes will further induce uh, changes in our behavior in the near future. So we uh, still need to carefully watch what will take place from now. And uh, what is important here is these uh, chain reaction of changes will further uh, deepen the inequalities and vulnerability unless we take decent measures. So uh, uh, with uh, these points in mind, we discussed uh, it is uh, essential to make sure that we listen to and work with the most vulnerable groups at all stages of the changes of the societies or living conditions. 
And uh, to this end, uh, actually, uh, the session TT5 uh, had uh, quite many hints from the activities uh, taking place at the ground level, community level, or cities level. The panelists at the TT5 session shared the various impacts that hit the community or city level actions for sustainable living and uh, some of the unique responses to overcome these challenges. Uh, for example, uh, at a project on promoting education for sustainable living in South Africa, participants uh, immediately started reviewing their actions and made schools at, as the community center for self-supplying food and access to uh, clean water. And in another rural development project in Colombia, uh, people uh, faced difficulty in and continuing the uh, in-person workshop for uh, educating the farmers, but uh, they created a virtual space where farmers and experts or younger and old generation can exchange their knowledge to each other to, to continue their activities. So uh, from these uh, good uh, cases, I'd like to highlight that these responses were not well-planned ones, but rather uh, patchworks and improvisations to combine different people, skills, places, and technologies to respond immediately to the crisis. So uh, patchworking and improvisations are indeed main weapons for the people to combat vulnerability and inequality in an inclusive manner. So, uh, and uh, these methods enabled them to critically review their uh, living context and their, their capacities to address the challenges. So, uh, in short, uh, actually I support my colleague's argument on the importance of coherence or system thinking and having a coherent visions for the future society. But uh, I would also like to remind the audience that uh, uh, about the importance of the encouraging flexible creative actions among people from different backgrounds for more inclusive society. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mataba san for your uh, comment on lifestyle change with very much, much many concrete examples. So uh, I have only six minutes for three persons. Sorry. So the next, Andresan. Uh, sorry for wait, keep keep you waiting, but. Uh, he is a program director of the Natural Resource and Ecosystem Service Unit, so please give uh, your comment. Thanks, Takahashi Shoujo. I'll try, try and be brief. I think from a biodiversity perspective, the pandemic has, uh, to a large extent, accentuated what we already knew, or at least what the experts already knew. And the background to that is that the global population continues to grow, and it's expected to keep doing that until several decades from now after which it's expected to drop off. And then both the growth and the drop off have their own challenges as we've seen in different countries in the world. And with that, the, uh, the density and the spread of humankind and the density and spread of zoonotic diseases like uh, COVID uh, will uh, you know, take their course and uh, be as, as unpredictable as they've uh, proven to be. And then uh, hand in hand with that, uh, the footprint of humankind, both individual and at the society level, uh, is perhaps an even bigger challenge, especially in the, uh, the developed world, where minority of the world's population, but the majority of the footprint. And that in turn goes hand, with, hand in hand with the rapid movement of people around the world and people and, and goods, which again uh, has huge implications for transmission. So what can we do about that? Um, there are some things, and I'll just touch on two of them very briefly from a biodiversity point of view again. One is that there's a lot of talk about habitat transformation and its effect on transmission. More specifically, tropical deforestation and fragmentation of uh, forested habitats in the tropics is leading to a much more porous habitat. In other words, people can access those habitats at a vastly increasing extent. If we can nip that in the bud, then we'll be doing a lot to decrease the future risk of pandemics and transmission. And then secondly, the global trade in species, in wild species, including endangered species, needs obviously far more um, systematic and globally agreed upon regulations. At the moment, uh, different countries are doing their own thing and there's not really much global accountability. So that's uh, with regard to sustainability and resilience. And then just a very quick comment to end on inclusivity. 
uh, despite the degree to which global cultural movements are um, in the spotlight these days, they are not benefiting the most uh, vulnerable communities in the world. And what we really need to do is to bring those communities into the global discussion. This has been touched on by some of the, the other speakers. Organizations like IPES are doing a lot to make this happen by including indigenous and local knowledge as one of the focus areas that they're working on. Uh, and that kind of thing uh, needs to uh, increase while at the same time uh, keeping an eye on the, the rigor that we need in terms of uh, pursuing the, the facts to, uh, to deal with uh, crises like these. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adrian, for your thoughtful, thoughtful comments from the perspective of biodiversity. Then next, uh, I would like to ask Zosan, uh, who is a research leader of the Strategic and Qu Quantitative Analysis Center for her views. Zosan, please. Uh, thank you, Takahashi Shocho, for giving me the opportunity to share my views. Uh, I think the idea of uh, building a sustainable, resilient, and inclusive society uh, beyond the COVID-19 itself is a great perspective based on the integration of the three dimensions of sustainable development and the balance of um, development, risk management, and people. The COVID-19 pandemic and the society's immediate responses have impacted not only the public health, but also the continuity of economic activities and the functioning of infrastructure and relevant services through the interlinkages of various segments of the society. Uh, as well as on the social dimension, particularly on the vulnerable uh, groups. For building back better from COVID-19, it is important uh, to ensure policy coherence uh, to balance the three dimensions uh, and manage uh, disaster risks, particularly uh, related to climate change and uh, biodiversity loss in the planning and implementation of uh, the post-COVID-19 recovery uh, measures. Uh, understanding the interlinkages between the various aspects of uh, sustainable development is important uh, to inform a policy integration. Uh, at EDGES, uh, we developed a free online tool on SDG interlinkages uh, to enable the users uh, to navigate and uh, visualize uh, the interlinkages uh, between the sustainable uh, development goals. Uh, it helps uh, uh, understand how achieving a one development goal uh, impacts on achieving others, uh, either positively or negatively. And this is important to support policy integration at both horizontal level and to address across sectoral impacts and at the vertical level to take account of the impacts across uh, jurisdiction uh, border, uh, boundaries and the inequalities at the local level caused by uh, the implementation of uh, national uh, policies. On November 10th, uh, we organized the thematic track session four uh, on understanding SDG synergies and trade-offs for sustainable, resilient, and inclusive development, uh, during which experts from Europe and Asia provided uh, their views on how to understand the SDG synergies and trade-offs, and more importantly, on how to address them in the real world. Based on scientific evidence, analytical tools, and practical case studies uh, in developing uh, Asian countries uh, at the river basin level. Uh, as concluded by the session uh, moderator, uh, Professor Takeuchi, president of AGIS, that achieving the SDGs as a whole, uh, rather than addressing it partially, is important to ensure sustainable, inclusive, and resilient development for all. Effective management of the synergies and trade-offs is an important task for policy integration and for achieving the SDGs in a holistic manner. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, <coughs> thank you, Zosan, for your enlightening comment uh, from the perspective, perspective of the uh, interlinkages between SDGs and other important issues. So, uh, lastly but not least, uh, I'd like to ask Fujino-san, who is the program director of the city task force uh, for your the comment, final comment from the <coughs> staff, please. Yeah, thank you very much, takashi -san. Yeah, I have a three keywords. One is disparity, and second one is digital collaboration, and then last one is hybrid with the trust. Um, about the disparity, uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, 
uh, there are many people who are in a very bad situation. Uh, no job, or no food, or no energy, or less food, less energy, less job. Um, how we will tackle with the, this quite difficult situation? Um, maybe, for example, local area, rural area, agricultural area, they may have more food, or they may have potentially energy, renewable energy. So how we will have such a safety net, or how we can support to develop such a uh, area? And then when I talk with the uh, people in Fukushima, um, the lady said that the, the situation is quite similar to the, like uh, just after the East Japan earthquake or also disaster, uh, nuclear energy disaster. Um, they talk with the uh, invisible things like a uh, radioactive manner and then COVID-19 also invisible things. So it is something similar, but how to take care of the, such as the people who is in difficult uh, situation. Second one is digital collaboration. On the other hand, the, as the Tamura san mentioned, um, this COVID-19 uh, made a, a huge transition from the like a physical contact to the online virtual uh, communication. Like uh, what I just mentioned uh, during the Q&A session, uh, we support the uh, KL Kuala Lumpur city uh, together with the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. Now we have very easy to having a meeting then it makes very good communication also good uh, result. So such a digital collaboration uh, will be a very good uh, technology solution, innovation for our next future. The last one, hybrid with trust. Even though uh, digital collaboration can make happen, we need to, to having good, com uh, the, uh, we may have another opportunity to know new people. I mean that is the, only the online communication. Sometimes we miss a chance to meet the someone who is not around me, around us. So how we can have a good hybrid between uh, like uh, digital and also uh, real communication? But we need good trust. Um, otherwise, um, we have we know uh, some some uh, country have quite difficult situation, and uh, it makes uh, a disparity. But the how we will have a good future with hope. That's a, that's a key word by the, uh, Mr. Wada, Director General of Ministry of Environment, Japan. Um, how we will have a future with hope or attractive future uh, with a uh, uh, kind of a hybrid communication with trust. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fujino san for your very stimulating uh, intervention with a very uh, clear three key words. Thank you very much. So, uh, I'm sorry that time is, uh, uh, I, we have already exceeded a few minutes beyond the original schedule, so I would like to close the session. So once again, I would like to thank all the people in the audience who joined this session and provided useful hints for our future research and uh, operations. I would also like to thank all IGES colleagues, not only those who appeared in this session, but also those who dedicated themselves to the success of each session with all kinds of con contribution in substance, administration, technical support, and translation. Amongst others, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to all our partners, international organizations, national and local governments, business, youth, academia, and fellow think tanks. After listening to the statements made by my colleagues and all the speakers who were able to join us today and sessions earlier this month, I have renewed my recognition that although we are facing unprecedented difficulties due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we have a significant and critical opportunity to transform our society into a zero carbon, sustainable and resilient society, which is the common objective of the global society. The component, uh, components of the triple R framework, response, recovery, and redesign, will be useful to enhance the co coherence and inter integration of policies. I also recognize that all our endeavor to move forward toward a sustainable, resilient, inclusive so uh, future is only made possible with a dynamic uh, partnership we have with all stakeholders. And finally, I would like to stress that I just, as an agent of change in Asian Pacific region, will continue its, our utmost efforts to engage in policy research activities and propose innovative policy options and actions in collaboration with a broad range of stakeholders in, the, in this region and the world over. Uh, this is my biggest takeaway from ISAP 2020, and I hope that we can strengthen this partnership even further in, this, in the future. So thank you very much for staying with us until this, the end of this session. Thank you. 
。ありがとうございました。Thank you very much. This concludes the plenary session five. Thank you very much for your participation for the entire program today. We would now like to invite Dr. Nobutoshi Miyoshi of IGES, Managing Director of IGES. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm Miyoshi, Managing Director of IGES. Thank you for your participation in the plenary session of ISAP 2020, Just Transitions Toward Sustainable Societies in Asia and the Pacific, Building Forward Better for Our Future Beyond. As has been discussed throughout the program, The pandemic of the Nobel coronavirus has brought about dramatic and sudden changes in the socioeconomic structures as well as in the ways of life and value systems in the world we live in. Until last year, ISAP had been held at the end of July in Yokohama. After several attempts to reschedule the event, we have decided to organize this year's event fully online. During the five days between November 9th and 13th, we have held 13 thematic sessions, and we have had a keynote session followed by five plenary sessions today. I would like to take this opportunity to express our heartfelt thanks to all the panelists and discussants and offer my apologies for the inconveniences this format may have caused. Indeed, having an event fully online was a challenge for us. I must admit that we are still in the process of trial and error. Especially, we are still working on how to ensure two way communication, which we have taken for granted in an online format. In the meantime, I am pleased that the online format has allowed us to send out our messages across the world with all the experts from around the world. I think that this has resulted in the opportunity for us to send out our messages to the world. Until last year, we have been able to ensure access to our messages only to those who were able to make themselves present at the venue on dates we designated. But this year, anyone who had internet access had been able to get connected real time. Furthermore, those who could not attend the live streaming have been able to watch it later on demand. There is an interesting statistic that I would like to share with you. When we analyzed the view viewership of the thematic sessions held prior to the plenary today, we learned that the number of people who tuned in into English streaming were large, larger than that in Japanese. Furthermore, the number of people who watched other And these outcomes were something beyond what we expected, and we are now faced with the need to consider how best to send out our messages in this new world. In addition to online sessions, we also have tried to carry out virtual ISAP exhibitions for the very first time. I'm sure that there is a plenty of room for improvement, so I need to ask that you provide candid opinions. As to how to improve the virtual exhibitions via our online surveys. I would like to reiterate our appreciation for the participation by our partners, despite their busy schedule. As has been discussed at the end of the plenary, our ties and collaboration with our valued partners are becoming increasingly important. We look forward to coordinating. With our partners, as we work hard to overcome current challenges with the critical viewpoints of emergency response, recovery crisis, and the commitment to sustainability and resilient in the, resilience in the world. With the conceptual framework of triple R's of response, recovery, and resilience, we look forward to working with you all. I also look forward to meeting you face to face in the near future. Please stay safe and healthy. With this, I would like to officially close ISAP 2020. Thank you again very much for your support and participation.